Well, hello everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I think the barbecue sausages and the extra credit really worked. <laughs> we have a good turnout. So, you know, I was actually um, very honored, really excited to be asked to be here. Um, I uh, consider myself new to Platteville still. I began as the director of the mining at Rollo Jameson Museums in July. And I've uh, just started to meet some people here at the UW Platteville campus. I think Pamela Toss, who introduced me, was uh, one of the first faculty members who I met, who was kind enough to have some senior students from the Sustainability and Renewable Energy Systems program, having some of her students uh, partner with us. Uh, did a lot of wonderful things, like convert the mine lighting to LED, uh, prepare uh, the, one of the levels of our museum to receive, receive UV film and, uh, and solar filters. I got to I met uh, Evan Larson, who's in the room, the geographer. We had some great uh, conversations about geography, uh, getting to know some of his students. Uh, Gene Tesdall, history professor, also has worked very closely with me in the museums in the past. Uh, if you know Garrison Ledbury, who's currently the president of the Sigma Pi fraternity, he is uh, going to be a public history intern for the museum this summer. And of course, Yari Johnson, I have the reclamation uh, department. He'll be working with the museums next year to help us grow and plant some driftless area natives in the new museum garden terrace. Um, Gokul as well, also, we had some great conversations about material science and trying to localize uh, high tech industry with uh, you know local produce and, and way of life on the land. I'm sure we'll have lots of neat conversations uh, in the future. But what's kind of exciting to me about this talk today is that it'll be a little bit different than a lot of the talks I present just for the museum alone, because I'm not going to be talking a lot about super detailed geology or just a lot about mining history, but really I'm going to be kind of dwelling in what uh, Dr. Tesdall refers to as the borderlands, uh, this sort of frontier space in between the fields of natural science, cultural science, cultural history, science and industry. Um, and art. Now actually, um, I have kind of a unique perspective on the Driftless area. I didn't grow up here. I actually grew up in uh, a southern state that will remain nameless where people get a lot of sunburns and you know it, you have salt water. And so I always, when my grandparents retired to a farm nearby Mineral Point, I thought it was just magnificent with the shady oak trees and the cold freshwater creeks, the water crests and the creeks, the deer and all the and so uh, for my semi-nomadic years, uh, I always came back here. I've been living here several years in a row. Um, I actually, this landscape inspired me to go off and study geology. I did it in Arizona and had a long digression in the mineral industry, um, doing mineral exploration and mining in, in the copper realm before finally circling back and uh, studying geology, at uh, studying uh, architecture at Taliesin, in the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture. And you may know that this great uh, father of modern architecture has his studio um, in nearby Spring Green and then winters out west in Arizona. So anyway, this kind of unique perspective, uh, let's call it a romantic perspective on the Driftless area, is part of what I'm bringing to some new programming ideas here at the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museum. So for example, um, this past December, we had the first annual Holiday Mine Sing. And so in addition to the Platteville Chorale singing Christmas carols inside the museum, we all went underground into the mine and the Men's Cornish Chorus sang traditional Cornish songs underground in the mine. So let's go ahead and get started. What I really want to do here tonight is to propose a philosophy on the nature of place. And that idea is that the landscape can and does, even without our knowing it, inextricably connect the realm of the natural world with the human built realm. So my viewpoint is that every place fundamentally is defined by what we might call terroir. So terroir, it's a French word, and we really don't have an equivalent word in the English language. Um, and uh, you know, as in American English, we are more than happy to sometimes adopt words from other languages uh, if, if, it, if it's a really great concept, which, which this is. So terroir is what makes this place distinctive from another. 
and usually you describe it as being a positive factor. So you don't usually say something has a bad terroir or it is a bad terroir. It's only if this is a really good terroir because really great produce grows here. It actually started with a wine industry and so a, a good terroir is one that positively influences the flavors of the fine wines that are grown and produced within a discrete region. Now at one time the taste of terroir was considered to be negative. It was a kind of a gaminess that you would want to overcome. But later, and now, terroir is a character that you actually look for, in some cases, in a wine. And that character is considered to be distinct from the varietal. In other words, it doesn't matter what kind of grape it is or who made the wine. What they care about is where it was grown and produced. And so now, though, that term is not only used for wines, but all kinds of produce. Uh, like, for example, beers or cheeses in our region, uh, a whole variety of produce. Um, and I find myself expanding the use of that term to describe this local character also in art and in architecture. Except rather than sort of from the forces of nature, we're now dealing with the choices of the designer uh, to purposefully highlight and respond to the physical qualities of place that shape our culture and root our lives here as distinct from somewhere else. So an example of a work of art that possesses the character of terroir, I might argue, would be the site plan from a portion of Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin Estate near Spring Green. Um, I'll have some other examples a little bit later. But basically, long story short, the primary factors, factors that define a terroir are, number one, bedrock geology. Our bedrock geology, of course, uh, we have a layer cake of this beautiful buff-colored limestones, dolostones, stones, and sandstones from Paleozoic time some 500 million years ago. The second factor that defines terroir is topography. And we've got great topography um, in, in the Driftless area. Even in our corner of it, we're not flat, but, rel but our hills are defined by a branching dendritic network of streams and rivers that uh, reveal the bedrock under, you know, underneath the green stuff and those rocks were not scoured away or buried as they are in other parts of the Midwest that were glaciated during the last ice age. So, so far we've got bedrock geology and topography that defines a terroir. The other thing that defines it is microclimate. Now for some reason I picked a slide of an underground cave. Well, a cave is a kind of a microclimate and if you ever have set foot in one of our freezing cold streams, about 50 degrees, it's because we have these underground rivers that flow through uh, limestone you know, some distance down and it's about 50 degrees down there. So that's one example of a mic microclimate. But other examples are if you take a long hill uh, shaped that has a nose and two sides, uh, each different side of that hill has a different solar orientation, the sun brings a different azimuth, a different altitude, and so each side of that hill has a different microclimate. Those are factored into the terroir. And last but not least, all those other things have a biological result. And that result includes microbiotica, yeasts, mold, fungi, and bacteria. And those microbes not only live in harmony with the geochemistry of our soil, but they also catalyze the magic of plant fertilization. Soil is alive. And uh, furthermore, those same microbes also then help with the fermentation of the foods that help to preserve them, uh, but also add flavor to these foods. That's what we're talking about with terroir. Now this is a photograph from Napa, California. All around the world, whether it be Rioja, Spain, Bordeaux, France, Toscana, Italy, terroirs are recognized as special places whose climate, topography, geology, and their culture, the way of life that results from that place, define a distinct placeness. And far from the negative connotations of, say, provinciality, or what you, sometimes you hear with the word country, terroir suggests a noble approach to farming, building, eating and living that draws inspiration from the best that the land has to offer and it aspires to raise that to an articulate and a purposeful level. So if you think about in the food movement today, slow food, farm to table, field to fork, the locavore movement and so forth, 
and in my opinion, some local notable examples of art, architecture, and so forth, historic ways of life on this land. The knowledge and embrace of terroir not only in, offers the region's inhabitants like us the fruit of survival, but it also is nourishing our long-term sustenance in the intellectual and the emotional realms. Okay, so this terroir viewpoint represents what I might call like a benevolent geographical determinism in the landscape realm. But it also recognizes free will in the realm of human choice. So by studying the ways a place is what it is, then you can experience the uniqueness with all of your senses and then connect that uniqueness to your knowledge and your values. Now by doing that, people who are creators, people who are the doers, then can have this bottomless source of creative inspiration to inform and heighten this positive experience of life in this sense of place, wherever it may be, including here in the Driftless area. Um, if you're a designer, or maybe you've heard this in, in whatever field that you're a part of, if you get design inspiration from biology, they call that biophilia, or biophilic design. If you get your inspiration from geology and rocks, they call that lithophilia. And you might say that terroir orientation is what I call a biolithophilia. Anyway, I propose that the terroir creators and doers are the farmer, the chef, the scientist, and I include the engineers in there, and all the technicians, and the architect. And it's through the focused choices of these, the growers and the winemakers and the cheesemakers and so forth, the beer brewers, they are allowing the place-based nuances of the flavor to add character to their work. And similarly, through the choices of the creative architects and artists and so forth, and place-oriented scientists or engineers, you're allowing the natural character of a certain place potentially to be developed in your work for the pleasure of all. So let's look at the farmer. I don't know if any of you know Gary Zimmer. He is, uh, lives in um, uh, kind of near Lone Rock. They're out in Clyde. And he is the, one of the founders of Midwestern BioAg. Uh, so he sells fertilizer. He's also a really productive farmer, uh, and including a dairy farmer. So some of the unique uh, issues that farmers have to deal with here, and I'm, I'm not an, an, a farmer by any means or in agriculture, but some of the things that this terroir presents as a challenge to the farmer, for example, is topography. And so in order to retain the soil, uh, contour farming and the beautiful patterns that we impose upon the landscape is one thing that our terroir calls for. Another thing is soil mineralization. Uh, if you talk to Gary, he's all about trying to develop the life in the soil, those microbes, and so coming up with a whole portfolio of nutrients that don't kill the life in the soil but rather develop it is his goal so that you get crops with deeper roots. Um, and with more vigor and so forth. The farmer also has to be sort of the boots on the ground conservationist, deciding what's gonna happen with those wooded draws or those steeper slopes. Um, and uh, they decide what minerals to put on the soil and whether or not those minerals are gonna run off then into a waterway or to somebody else's land. So those are some of the, the terroir challenges of certain farmers. Here's another interesting farmer that uh, I, I know, maybe you guys know Andy Hatch of Uplands Cheese. Uplands Cheese based in uh, Dodgeville there. He uh, and his wife um, are responsible for making the cheese and then they have partners who are responsible for raising the cattle and producing the milk. And his cattle, um, they you know, obviously eat hay in the winter but when they're eating the grasses and the herbs during the season, that's when they use the milk to make the cheese. They only make two kinds of cheese. One when they're eating the, you know, the green grasses and the herbs and the flowers, and that's it. It's the most decorated cheese in the United States called Pleasant Ridge Reserve. And uh, then in the fall, they make a different cheese when they first start eating the cut hay. Now, when you make cheese, then you have whey, kind of a byproduct. And instead of having that be garbage, what they do with the whey now is then they feed it to their, their, pit, their pigs. So these are red wattle pigs. And when they're not eating whey, they're also eating things like acorns and apples and so forth. And this is actually kind of similar to what they do over in Parma, Italy. In Parma, they make, um, they make the uh, Parma cheese, you know, Parmigiano Reggiano. And then the byproduct of that, they feed to the pigs 
and that's where you get prosciutto, that delicious, expensive ham. And so here we've got Andy Hatch making his own driftless prosciutto. Talk about terroir. Okay, this is a little off-the-wall terroir one. So in addition to cultivating crops, of course, there's a lot of people who are fascinated with the idea of foraging. And so native, one of the native plants we have is sumac, um, which it makes, uh, if you add it to water uh, or add it to food, adds a nice sort of bright citrusy flavor. And then there's uh, a, a plant called the prickly ash, and its beans, or its... Uh, its fruit is, are referred to as Sichuan peppercorns. So we actually have Sichuan peppercorns and sumac that grow out here. A lot of people don't necessarily eat with it, um, but uh, perhaps we could. And actually someone, after having read in Voice of the River Valley about um, the nature of sumac and its flavor profile and Sichuan peppercorn, uh, Shulin's chocolate in Mount Horeb actually created a Sichuan sumac Dominican dark chocolate bar. And uh, the floral orange flavor of the Sichuan peppers goes really well with the earthy lemon flavor of the sumac. When combined with the tartness of the sumac, the Sichuan pepper flavor becomes wonderfully juicy, in the words of Keith Burroughs. So going back here, uh, so we kind of covered the chef and the farmer uh, to some extent. So how about we look at the architect? So there was an interesting... Uh, doer and thinker named Friedrich Frebel in the 19th century, a German guy who was writing a book on the education of man. And he had been working to pay his bills for a professor at the university, looking at crystals under the microscope to uh, document all the different crystal habits. This was new stuff at the time. So he had to carve all the mineral habits out of blocks of wood. And in doing so, this philosophical guy said, all things in the universe you know, must sort of relate to this finite number of geometric forms. And so he came up with this idea that children can learn earlier than people used to think they could, and that you could have a school that would be like a garden, not only a garden of students, but a garden for students, and came up with this integrated uh, education system called the kindergarten. And kindergarten was a series of 20 gifts. It was a super rigorous educational uh, technique that began with teaching infants and then younger children and then older children how to see the universe of nature through not through the naturalistic lens of recreation, but rather through abstraction, what he was considering to be a more scientific approach where you look to the, the deeper reality of the thing through geometry. And so you would work with 3D blocks, and then you'd go into flat tiles, and then sticks, and then curved bits of metal, and then you'd work with thread, and you'd work with cut paper, and, and then you'd work with peas and toothpicks to create framework structures like later Buckminster Fuller would do with geodesic domes and so forth. And only after you learned the vocabulary of nature would you be allowed to have the plastic uh, gift of modeling clay. And not only would you be learning the vocabulary of nature through geometry, but you would be organizing these uh, forms to create beauty patterns on a grid. His was a rectangular grid, a square grid, but, but later practitioners would adapt this to other kinds of grids, hexagonal grids, parallelogram grids, triangular grids, etc. And so that actually inspired some notable American and other international architects, Frank Lloyd Wright included. So here we are actually at Taliesin. We've got um, one of the Hamblin boy, boys looking at a nest of a barn swallow, inspecting their construction technique. Before we get into the modern age, though, you know, the people weren't thinking so abstractly about a design. They were simply working with materials that were at hand and trying to go for survival. And in this neck of the woods in the Driftless area, one of the ways of life that drew people here was not only the plants and animals, but the rocks and minerals under our feet. And so here we have historian Tracy Roberts. Some of you may remember her from being a lecturer here in recent years. And uh, she is active with the museum as well. And Tracy has uh, done a lot of research on badger huts. So you may know that a lot of our early pioneers were prospectors who were searching for uh, lead and zinc ores. And those are kind of some of the dwellings in the ground that they lived in. And these kinds of subterranean dwellings are part of why, of course, Wisconsin is called the Badger State. Okay, later, a next wave of immigrants, say, around the 1820s, 1830s, came from Cornwall. Cornwall is uh, where the land ends at the southern tip of Great Britain, 
and they have been mining tin for 3,000 years and way harder rock than we have here is granite. And so uh, when they came here uh, to make their fortunes, the, they brought with them some of their vernacular from, um, from Great Britain. And so they would build some of these log cabins and some of the beautiful rock architecture that you could see if you visit Pendarvis Historic Site in Mineral Point, among other things uh, more local. And then, of course, uh, later they moved away a little bit from more vernacular buildings to some more formal or classical buildings. You may recognize these two buildings as the prominent works of educational architecture on the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museum campus. On the right, that beautiful rock school, which is a twin of Round Tree Hall, which is where the state's first normal school was based, and then later the mining school. Uh, that dates back to the 1860s, the brick building from 1905. And then locally people were using this local bedrock to create more uh, structurally complex buildings such as this water tower uh, that, that was used in uh, for the first sort of 20 years of the 20th century in Mineral Point. Uh, the stonemason, Charlie Curtis, came from Cornwall and boy could he cut rock so well that even Frank Lloyd Wright eventually used him to do some work over at Taliesin. Taliesin is interesting, Wright designed it when he came back uh, from Tuscany. And this is a rendering of how the house uh, isn't really built on top of the hill, but rather kind of wraps around the hill, creating a brow. And you can see how not only are some of the native trees integrated into the design, but also the landscape plantings echo the geometries of, of the building. Wright um, could have gone and worked just in Chicago when he had his big practice, but he um, made it choice that was really unusual in his day, which was to build, have his architectural practice out here in the countryside. And so he'd have dozens and dozens of apprentices at a time coming from big cities to move out into uh, the rural driftless area to uh, come up with concepts of urban design, urban planning, based on principles of rural life and better reflecting lo local ways of life. In more contemporary times, there are other biophilic or lithophilic designers uh, this happens to be from Johnson Schmalling out of Milwaukee, but uh, this is in the Blue Mounds area. They call it Topo House. And in this case, they're looking at the soil surface as live structural skin. That's another approach. Uh, here is an example of a gabion, a, a, a kind of a construction technique often used when budgets are low. And, uh, and so locally, I have seen this used uh, for bridges and certain retaining walls, but you never see the gabion exposed. Someone must think that it's ugly, so it's always hidden behind some concrete. But this is actually a winery in Napa called Dominus by Herzog and Demuron, and the gabion wall is actually a transparent monolith. And from inside that building, you don't have any windows, you just look out through the rocks inside the mesh, and that is a transparent building. Now this is the Aldo Leopold Legacy Center, in the Driftless area, near Baraboo, uh, by Kubalo and Washako architects. Um, this was uh, a lead platinum building, one of the most energy efficient buildings when it was built, uh, designed to have a low carbon footprint, wood construction, active and passive solar technology, and so forth. Those are some examples of, you know, the character of terroir being brought into the Driftless area. Now, I bring all this out, I don't usually talk about all that, because I'm the museum director, um, but I think that it's a really good preface to say, you know, well, what about mining? You know, what is mining? What is the, you know, how do we wrestle with that history? You know, how do things like uh, rocks and minerals and, um, and, the, and the chemistry that's involved with the mining industry, uh, how do we remedy that when we like more organic life ways and we're trying to be more environmentally conscious and so forth? What does that, that way of life have to do with this place? Well, let me just say something about our mission. Our museum's mission is to continue in the pursuit of excellence in the areas of regional and mining history. To achieve that purpose, our museum is commissioned to be a custodian of the past, to interpret the lead and zinc mining history of our region, as well as to preserve, interpret, and to display the artifacts that really define the region. Believe it or not, some people look at Platteville Mound and they're not even sure what the M stands for anymore. You know, they think maybe it should be a big P, well, actually, you know, the mining industry isn't currently uh, hiring anybody. We're not, they're not going to likely go and work for the mines in the Driftless area. And yet, there's something about this place uh, in which mining is an active legacy here. In fact, if you look at this map, 
uh, the Chandler map from the 19th century, it shows the upper Mississippi Valley mining district and all the wonderful towns from Gratchet to Pluro to Platteville and Mineral Point and Blue Mounds and beyond where all the diggings were and shows the artisanal mining and the hand miners would use a windlass to crank both men and materials in and out of the mine via a shaft. And the Badger miners, of course, are how our state received its name. And it was because of the rush on the lead, in particular, that Wisconsin became a state. Um, the kinds of ore deposits that we have here are indeed famous. Uh, wherever they are found worldwide, they are named for this place. They're called MVTs, Mississippi Valley Type Deposits. Um, what they are, are, do you see the rocks on the right? The shiny galena, which is a lead sulfide, the bone-like smithsonite, a, a, a zinc carbonate, and then the zinc sulfide sphalerite on the bottom. Those are among the minerals that are hosted in our local limestones and dolostones. They're either, like the one picture on the left, they're either sort of these crevice deposits or ramp and flat style deposits. And then wherever this is found, on the edge of basins around the world, whether it be in the American South, in Ireland, in Poland, in New Zealand, in Australia, they are called MVTs, Mississippi Valley type deposits. So Platteville actually, as you may know, had the mining college. And so we were the place where if you wanted to learn about MVTs, Platteville was a world center. And our little museum uh, remains really as the last uh, repository for detailed knowledge on MVTs. Um, you know, in just a brief recap of the history, we had a, the lead rush that, uh, you know, was really ramped up in the 1820s, but may have begun in the in 1600s. Um, we had then a lull in the mining period back then. If you know, in 1849, a lot of people went out to California to start mining gold. Well, it just so happens that there was a lull here, but there was also a shift. People were less interested in the lead, and all of a sudden they were going after the zinc carbonate. And believe it or not, Mineral Point became the world lead producer of, of zinc oxide in the world, with the neighboring towns, including Platteville, being right up there as well. Um, and so by 1900, there were enough innovations, both in the engineering side, with how to process some of these minerals, but also other things happened, like uh, the rise of joint stock companies meant that funds were available for small mining companies to all of a sudden develop these little uh, ore deposits on people's farms and in their backyards. And uh, also the normal school built a new building, which meant that the Roundtree Hall, which today are apartment buildings nearby, was available. And so it was pitched that Roundtree Hall would no longer be the normal school, but now the Wisconsin Mining Trade School opened in 1908. If you're interested in this period of history, this start of 1900 and the founding of the school that is today known as the UW Platteville, you're invited to come over to the museum on Sunday at 3 o'clock for the Miners Forum. James Hibbert, the head librarian for the university and some other notable historians and miners are going to come and have a really cool panel discussion on what was happening in that time period. Okay, after, after the founding of the trade school here, it was a depression time, but isn't that interesting? That's when the students of the mining school built the Big M. So times were rough economically, but up, people were still optimistic. Hope for the future. I should mention that the World Wars were playing a lot of uh, role in what was going on here. In this early 1900s, with the rise of World War I, boy, that's when Benton, Platteville, Cuba City, B-Town, all, all, all these towns were booming. Everyone was working in the mines. After the Depression, okay, then World War II in Korea, there was another boom time. And you'll notice, you see these head frame buildings. Uh, you see the pile of jack rock or tailings, waste rock. And those used to uh, dot the countryside here, even as recently as the early 1990s. Uh, you, they, you would have seen those everywhere out here. Just like today, you see cornfields, practically. Now, when I first moved out here in 1993, those were not visible any longer. And that is because the mining industry really was started ramping down, and by 1979, it was almost fizzled out. So the 1990s now was a period of reclamation. So uh, Yari Johnson and his, his predecessor you know, would have been part of uh, reclaiming mine sites, and so we realized that Part of the life cycle of a mine is not just its discovery and its development, but also its closure and even remediation and reclamation. Some of what we do at the museum is to celebrate, celebrate the miner. So we actually are 
job, our mission is to honor the men and women who worked in the trades connected to the mining industry in the Upper Mississippi Valley District and beyond. What we do is provide celebratory space. We provide educational space, we provide educational opportunities and learning opportunities in order to share their story. But even though we are a custodian of the past, uh, you know, we do not consider the museum to be a place where contemporary learning cannot take place. Now, on the contrary, you know, what we are, we are now considering ourselves a science lab, and museums are considered partnering with uh, really everybody in the room, to the extent that you're interested, uh, to present a contemporary understanding of the Driftless area, natural resource development, while we honor these historic perspectives and, and ways of life. We want to partner with different departments to research what Mississippi Valley type ore deposits are. They're still a little bit controversial, poorly understood. How did they form? Why are they distributed where they are? And how can what we know here inform explorers and miners for these ore deposits and other places around the world? Um, we recognize that concepts of reclamation, adaptive reuse, materials recycling, and more are also part of the story that the museum has to offer. Um, and really, frankly, the museum is a living laboratory for sustainability in the context of multiple land uses in the Driftless. But we're not only uh, you know, reaching out to miners and, and dwelling in the past, we're reaching out to youth. Uh, one of the most interesting programs we offer is uh, Young Pioneers in July. So if you have children or you'd like to be a child again, you can sign up for Young Pioneers and also College for Kids who are participating uh, in with the UW platform for their first time this year. Apparently, enrollment in the College for Kids is higher this year than ever before. Could be because of the museum program. I don't know. Uh, caring for collections uh, is part of what we do. Uh, we've got a large uh, mining museum collection, heavy equipment, uh, bars of lead, rocks and minerals, ore cans, models, dioramas of cross sections of the earth crust. Those are all founded in the 1960s when the city of Platteville decided to have a municipal museum. Um, then in 1980, we acquired the Rollo Jameson Collection, which is more about the rural way of life. And it's a cross-section of the way the average person lived in the pioneering days from the 1850s through the 1970s. And it's been described really as worthy of a Smithsonian Institute. We're stewarding the architecture. You may have seen some building projects in or around the museums, and that will only continue in the years to come. Um, as we seek historic uh, uh, preservation, uh, seek uh, historic, historic status listing on the state and federal registers of historic places, for example, stewarding our architecture above ground and below. Because as you may or may not know, in the backyard of the museum is an 1840s lead mine underground, which you access via 90 steps with a brand new stainless steel handrail from last year. And we offer Guided tours, May through October, today being May 1st, the first day we reopen, we'll be open daily, often to offer tours four times a day. And tours include a complimentary train ride on a 1931 mine train through the beautiful outdoor museum campus. Built in 1978, the local Optimists Club helped to raise the funds and the museum staff built the railroad by hand. Some of, some of our uh, summer workers, if you become a tour guide or an intern at the museum, some people actually get to work on the railroad as part of their job, which is a lot of fun. We've got a lot of neat programs. Every museum has the same problem, which is, well, I've been there before, so why do I need to go back? So we really are more like a venue, in some cases, in which we are offering a lot of really neat and interesting things that encourage people to come back many times during the year. You may have known that back in January, we brought back a, a, a much-loved Platteville tradition of the Miner's Ball, except instead of just being engineering students who put together a great dance, um, this was all for the community. We had 150 people turn out. Um, and we had a seven lecture, Lyceum lecture series from February to April. Um, this coming Sunday, we've got the Miners Forum. In June, we're going to have a Music Platteville uh, a children's chorus performing underground in the mine, which will be cool. Heritage Days on July 4th is a big block party where six or 700 people come to the museum. We have a community picnic, live music, games, historic games in the backyard. Uh, July is Young Pioneers in August. Okay, you may not know that this year is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo mission that put the men on the moon. And so we are uh, hosting a Driftless Star Party in August. And so this will be an adult um, and family-oriented event uh, where people will come after dark with telescopes and will look up at the stars. Um, in September, there's an annual historic reenactment that's huge in Platteville. It's celebrating its 22nd year. And then in October, 
uh, is the Haunted Mind Tour. And so I highly recommend that everybody comes for the Haunted Mind Tour at Halloween. Um, last year, the Sigma Pi fraternity uh, served as the ghosts. And so very uh, sweet, nice, friendly, uh, friendly, non-scary ghosts. And then, uh, of course, in December, we have the Holiday Mind Sing, where we have the 50 people Platteville Chorale come and sing Christmas around the uh, sing Christmas carols around a 14-foot Christmas tree, and then we go underground and sing some more. So really, you know, what we're trying to do is, is offer a Griffless area sense of place. And of our 10,000 visitors, most people are surprised to know that 51% are actually from out of state, and they're coming, they're driving through from the Mississippi to Madison, or the other way around, checking out this whole country, and finding out all the interesting things that, that, uh, that, that, they, that they saw on the film, uh, decoding the Driftless, or some of these other, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of wonderful thinkers who are bringing new light to this uh, physiographic product, uh, uh, to this region. Excuse my stutter. So there you have it. That's the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Some of them have then been digitized, and then now the uh, Southwest Regional Planning Commission, who has the office here in Platteville, does make that shape file available to the public. So part, you would think that with a lot of the towns in the area being kind of a Swiss cheese, if you will, underground mining, uh, you would think that it would be more common for people to know where the mines are before construction projects begin. But interestingly enough, that's not necessarily so. So one of the first things that we're doing is uh, making sure that, for example, because we're a municipal museum in the city of Platteville, it's able to offer to the public information on where known underground mines are, just so that when construction projects begin, sometimes you know, a wheel of a heavy machinery falls in the hole, et cetera, uh, or you have a sinkhole on your property and so forth. Um, some of them are not mapped. You know, it's interesting when you look at the distribution that you know, they don't go north of the Wisconsin River and they don't go farther than Blue Mountains. And they don't go, you know, much farther south than, than Galena. So it's a really discreet few horizons, you know, within the package of rocks that we have here. Hundreds of them, let's say. And some of them are small scale, and many ore deposits have not yet been discovered, and likely won't be developed because they're not economic these days. Yeah. So in our area, um, you would have had other kinds of, so what's interesting about ore is that ore is defined not by a mineral, by its mineralogy, but by its value to humans. And so, the, and, uh, you know, in the earliest days, for example, they're really after the galena, the lead minerals, and they threw all the zinc minerals on the waste pile. And then later that changed. And so uh, we, so people were not after other kind of commodities other than just those, but other beautiful minerals that are found along with them, for example, would be calcite. Um, there was, in some cases, some copper carbonates, you know, malachite, azurite, and so forth, uh, in the small area in the mineral point area. Marcosite, some hematite, you know, so some of these would be um, pretty rocks, or interesting rocks, but they were not considered uh, prized for their economical purposes. Now, if we get outside this so-called Mississippi Valley District, of course, within the state of Wisconsin, or in the upper Midwest, there are lots of other uh, kinds of rocks that have other ore deposits, um, you know, along certain waterways in the Driftless area, for example, uh, quartz sand is, uh, is a kind of ore. And those uh, mining technologies are very different from the underground technologies used in the 19th century or the early 20th century, and are a matter of some continuing discussion on how those might be regulated or how, once those mines closed, we might reclaim sites and stuff like that. Elsewhere, of course, northern Wisconsin, they also have banded iron formations, an important ore resource uh, that in the steel industry and many other industries. There are also volcanogenic massive sulfides uh, where you would find things like gold and even copper and other things, but not in our little region here. 
Any other questions? Yes, sir. So I feel like we're going to get the word terroir popular. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that. So when I look at the museum campus, it's not as large as yours here, right? but we are two and a half acres and we have some lovely green space between the buildings. And some areas that uh, now are used as, say, heavy machinery lay down yards, I think we might be able to, at some point in the coming years, consider it during the planning process. Maybe we could represent, beyond uh, the uh, mineral development, we could represent, say, agriculture. And I could see perhaps a small vineyard or a small orchard on museum campus, representing not just the planting of annuals in the driftless, but also these perennial crops. Um, or a small prairie restoration, actually, somewhere would be nice. We don't need a big prairie, just a little one. Um, we have real estate development, well represented. But, uh, you know, there is someone in Platteville, Bear Kearns, who did it, um, open a winery, and they did, and a couple of years ago, a closed vineyard, so they're not making wine now, but there are people who are trying to make wine in the area. Botham is a little closer. Botham makes decent wine. They are closer to um, Bloom to Barneveld, and a nice winery to tour. The people are nice. You know, it's the problem is that with the cold weather, you know, it's hard to every winemaker is bringing a certain percentage in from Finger Lakes or you know out west somewhere like that. They're only growing a little bit on, on our estate, um, and it, and the architecture is you know still developing, I think, you know, as we find, we understand the terroir better, we'll bring more terroir character into the wineries. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Ask one more. Are you, you aware of any special group that come close together to do some hunting in the wine? hobby? Yes, there are, in Wisconsin, hobbyists who go out looking for fossils or or other pretty rocks of some kind or another. Some go prospecting, uh, hoping for to make economic gain. And sometimes they're called rock hound groups. And we don't have a local rock hound group right now that I'm aware of. If they do, they fly under the radar. But maybe it would be fun to start one. And so if if we did, you know, I might be interested in joining that group. I also want to carve out a space on the museum campus where we can have a lapidary studio for people who want access to a rock saw. Because if you find a really great rock, sometimes the best way to see its beauty is to saw it and polish the cut side. And so we need a polishing wheel and uh, rock saws. Sometimes people will tumble a rock uh, to make it shiny and pretty. There, um, some people make uh, jewelry from the rock. And there are some really notable um, art schools in the area, for example, Sheikh Rag Alley Center for the Arts in Mineral Point, where they make jewelry. And so let's say we were to have a rock hound club and then do, make the cabochons, and then they go and take a class somewhere else and put it inside a beautiful necklace. I mean, some people are really into that. No reason we couldn't get into that here. Definitely, and just think about the fundraisers you could have if you had some really great rocks uh, or jewelry to sell that you had made yourself as a group. Any other questions or comments? Yes? I'm curious about the legacy of mine in terms of uh, the social life. I'd like to see more, more of those kinds of studies. And one thing that's different about these underground mines from coal mines is that it was less hazardous. They didn't have a kind of off gassing uh, or they didn't have the black lung problems. Uh, it was just that mineralogy is different enough that the problems were different. One thing is that these mines were damp. I don't know enough and I'd like to learn more about what kind of microbiotica are found underground and is it nice to have that in your lungs all the time? You know, I live in kind of in a 1850s miner's cottage uh, and I feel like sometimes I wonder if, you know, that's really good for my lungs and so you think that surely underground there are problems. And when they were drilling with a pneumatic drill, it would create dust, but the, 
the drill bit would be lubricated with water, and so that dust was kept down. So it wasn't a lot of particulates floating around. If anything, you would have to be in probably mud, you know, or water on the ground sometimes would be an issue. And so when you see historic photographs of mine workers, they often look like they were in these jumpsuits that, you know, were pretty darn filthy, and they'd be straddling drills that would have pneumatic fluid, you know, and water squirting all over them. So I'm sure it was messy work. But one thing that I hear, just thinking of the social impact, is this amazing camaraderie among people who work together underground in this unusual kind of light condition in which if you turned off your lamp, you wouldn't be able to see an inch in front of your face. And uh, you, know, you know how they would access the mines, you know, even as recently as the 1970s, in some cases, um, would be via a hoist. It would be a bucket, an iron bucket, which uh, multiple guys would go in and two at once, say six guys at once, with one leg in and one leg out. And the one sticking out would be so to keep yourself from banging against the rock wall. So there was an element of danger. They were drilling and they would be blasting. So there's always this fear of potential uh, death by crushing. Um, you know, it's fun to hear about the folklore of some of the earliest miners, uh, say the Cornish, for example, in the 1830s and 40s. Rock falls would be blamed on Tommy knockers, the fairies of the mine who make mischief, and so the miners would eat their Cornish pasty and leave them a little bit of crust. Um, so there was there was a potential danger. It would be interesting to know more specifics: how dangerous, how many injuries, how many deaths, and uh, you know. And if you work, work, work in a in a heavy equipment, heavy operation operation today, you know, there's a real safety focus. You wear your personal protective equipment, your hard hats, and your eye protection and hearing your steel toes and all that kind of stuff. And I was just looking at a stock certificate from a mine here in Plateau awarded in 1920 that was praising a certain company for the number of, you know, no injuries on their site. So I think there were people were at an early age, at an early, relatively early age, trying to minimize human injuries and, and deaths because it wasn't good for business, no, it wasn't good for the town, you were working with your friends and loved ones, so people were looking after each other. I think it warrants more study. It would be great to have some exhibits on that, maybe a paper, a whole talk, maybe next year's panel discussion should be on mine safety over the different generations. I think it's a great topic. Yeah? Yes. There are many ore deposits still in the ground. Sometimes, like depending on what happened when the company went out of business, maybe there was a ore deposit, you know, there were ore minerals visible within the edifice of the underground mine that they didn't get at yet. But more likely, they kind of got the stuff they could see and then stopped. And there are some that just haven't been discovered yet. And it's fun to think about. You know, I hear people saying, uh, they ask a question like, is it true that there's more undiscovered lead and zinc than it was ever developed? And it's hard to speculate exactly. But there, you know, if we were to explore for those now, it would be so easy. All, you know, the geophysical techniques that we use for exploring, let alone things like uh, stream water sampling or well water sampling um, to, to look for sulfates and certain other uh, things that are in the, in the groundwater, um, drilling. I mean, um, it's just that they are they're wet mines. There are similar ore deposits in Missouri, and their mines are totally dry, which makes it a much more pleasant place to work here, damp. And it also makes it more likely to crumble on you because there's groundwater circulating, little cracks, and so forth. They're not very big, and we don't have any precious metals mixed in. In Missouri, they also have a little bit of silver mixed in, and so that makes them much more economical than ours. So we may never know the answer to your question. Anything else? Well, I'll stick around and I'm uh, happy to answer any more questions and love, love to meet you. Also, may I just uh, share an open invitation to come and visit us at the um, museum sometime. You're welcome to come by, even if you don't uh, buy a tour, browse the gift shop. Um, we've got great programs like uh, Haunted Mind Tour, you know, in, in October. Please feel free to come by sometime when your schedule allows. Yes, sir? Great. Great. Love to see your love to see your son. Thanks for having me.